if you're not. Hey, camp followers! It is Sunday, it's seven o'clock. I am super excited. Um, I haven't been here for weeks. So, um, if I'm a bit rusty, I do apologise. Esme's been taking the lead on our Facebook lives. But I had to step in and grab this um, interview because it's something really close to my heart. I listened to Heli's lecture on online pet health a few months back and it just it just stopped me in my tracks. And I thought I needed to get this lady out talking to the public. So online pet health is a platform where it's um, professionals to professionals. So Heli has given up her time to bring the content of her lecture to you in your living room. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. So please listen in. Um, Heli, please tell us a bit about yourself first, and then we'll go into what we're going to talk about. And amaze us. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. My name is Heli. I'm from Finland, and you can clearly hear my accent, so please forgive me. I hope everybody understands at least most of the things I'm about to say. I work in University of Helsinki at the veterinary faculty at the Department of Equine and Small Animal Medicine. And I'm a clinical researcher, which means that I am working with patients as a physiotherapist, as well as a researcher. And I'm actually doing a research at the moment on the effect of physiotherapy on osteoarthritis in dogs, which is funded by the Academy of Finland. Um, so that's what I do. And I'm here to tell lots of things or lots of opinions, at least. Yeah from the point of view of a physiotherapist who works with dogs with OA. Yeah, and you've also done a lot of work with humans, which is a really good angle, because we were, just before we went live, talking about the topic of obesity, how it is such a kind of taboo subject, and it's, it's kind of funny, because we were just laughing how people find it easier to hear that they're overweight than hearing that their dog's overweight, and there's a different emotional response. <laughs> And one's off the Richter scale, yeah. Um, and you've had experience of both, so I think this is going to be a brilliant chat. So oh, let me. Oh, oh. oh, it will be. It will be. The reason that I needed to get her on this platform is because obesity, overweight, um, it is now considered a welfare concern. So the vet compass with the, the royal um. Royal Vet College, the University of Sydney, they tap into practices in and around the UK, they process the data, they tell us what we're seeing, what are big problems, what's the most common thing we see, what's the most severe thing that we see, what's the longest lasting thing that we see. And April 2019, they published um, their report, which suggested that the biggest, the three biggest welfare concerns in small animals is obesity, mental disease and osteoarthritis. And so we've got obesity and osteoarthritis here this evening. We're talking about it. What's quite sad is that there's more and more and more information coming out about this problem, but it's not changing. So I actually, in preparation for um, a report I'm writing for work, I've been ripping up articles from vet magazines, nurse magazines, the companion animal magazines, therapy magazines. There's so much information out there about dealing with this why is it not changing so i'm hoping by the end of tonight with a pretty harsh mm -hmm. chat that we're going to have that we're going to add a new level of understanding and action to manage this disease better because what you're going to hear from heli is going to shock you because i was like oh my god so tell us what we're going to talk about you know the whole biomechanics. Let's where, where, where should we start? So, um, I'd like to start from a very practical point of view. Basically, what I want to talk about tonight is the obesity. I mean, we've all heard it a million times. Obesity is bad. No one should be obese. Obesity is bad, bad, bad. And we know all the different things that are related to it. But to take it to a very practical level let's say and let's talk about the actual effect on how the dog moves and how the obesity affects the movement and then also what comes out from it because the dog needs to move no matter what any dog needs to move somewhat so 
the little we know about how the obesity affects the movement, in other words, the biomechanics, um, it's not good news. No, it's not <laughs> we, good news. We don't because... know much about it yet, but the little we know, it is, like you said, it is actually really severe. And it's actually something every owner can see in their dogs once they know what they are looking for. So, yeah. so that's what I would like to talk about today. Yeah, definitely. Because on a practical level, we've been shouting about cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. for years, but they can't see it. We've been shouting about the incidence of diabetes. They can't see it. We've been shouting about pro-inflammatory states. They can't see it. This you can see. Yeah. And you can now take what you see and go, oh, that's what it means. And then hopefully that goes, oh, God, that's what it means. Yeah. Right. I got to do something about this. OK, yeah. Yeah. so as you guys probably have heard a 100 times on this platform, adipose tissue, excess adipose tissue is a source of pro-inflammatory mediators, which means that if you've got an inflammatory state, it is going to be made worse. We know arthritis is inflammatory. That basically means that that excess fat that adipose tissue is petrol on an inflammatory fire. So you're basically pouring petrol onto your dog's inflamed joints. I've shouted about it for years. We've had all the cam team shouting about years. Let's now add another layer. So tell us what. <gasps> can, I, can I also say one thing on this, actually? This is really well put and this is really well said, but it's really, really, really in important to kind of understand that there are different layers to why and how it keeps the inflammation inflammation fueled yeah. so it's for me when i wasn't even a physio yet it was like a huge light bulb above my head when i realized that the actual existence of fat in your yeah. tissues it is literally the fact that there is fat that that already keeps the inflammation going. It, it is yeah. literally just, it doesn't have to be the weight of it, what we are going to talk about today, but it yeah. is just that it exists and you're, yeah. you're having this low level inflammation burning all the time. So it is literally like fuel, just that yeah. it's there. But then there is the mechanical aspect to it too, like, which is our today. Topic. Yeah, and you were talking in your lecture about how you can see lipid droplets yeah. within the collagen structure yeah. of ligaments and tendons. So it isn't just fat in blobs underneath the skin or yeah. surrounding the organs, which is what us vets see. You know, we always fear the bitch spay where you open up and go, oh my God, yeah. I don't know and where the smell of it are. Something that people actually don't know, if you open the skin and there is a layer of fat, which is yellow and yeah. thick, and the smell of it, it it's is one good. of the most disgusting, I'm, I'm sorry everybody, but it is vulgar. The smell it of is fat good. is really, really bad. And that tells you like, ooh, oh, oh my yeah. God, that's not okay. Yeah. It but I think um, like poison basically. Mm. Yeah, it does. It is like poison. But I think I hadn't really thought about the microscopic effect of the lipid droplets in yeah. extracellular matrix yeah. with structure yeah. of things that we rely on. Like, you know, I'm I'm pulling my thumb around and the ligaments are keeping the joint in place. Now just imagine if that's all kind of disrupted and it hasn't got the same tensile strength and what I could do with my thumb. And it actually with, does affect the col um, collagen tissue as well as the tendons the way yeah. they function and heal is way worse when there is fat tissue in there than if yeah. it's on a lean specimen as in yeah. lean human or lean dog and i yeah. actually once had to have an mri taken of my own back because yeah. i injured my back and at the time i had a little bit extra weight on so i was obese overweight and i still remember how it said in the um in the report from the radiologist it said surprisingly little fat inside <laughs> and this is the important part within the muscles and between the muscle cells so yeah. he was actually expecting this overweight middle-aged lady to have fat infiltration more of it in the muscles 
And he yeah. was surprised that there wasn't that much fat inside. And this is the key, because if there had been, that would then affect the way my muscles work, and it would explain why my back was so painful when there was nothing else broken. Yeah. So that's also, yeah. It, it does get into places, and it does affect the function of different tissues, like muscle and tendon. It really, yeah. there really shouldn't be droplets there. But there are yeah. studies about how the fat actually gets into different tissues, and then yeah. they do not function the way they should do. So that just, um, just, yeah. just briefly, be a, be a bit of a physio for me and explain to people that have just had arthritis diagnosed in their dogs why the surrounding soft tissue is important. So they are massively focused on cartilage and bone and joint cartilage bone joint cartilage bone joint that's what i hear and read online yeah, yeah. what is important about these soft tissues so that they understand why me and you going oh my god there's fat destroying function yeah. what is yes. explain? The thing is we can kind of think of because the arthritis is in a joint okay yeah and we can we could divide the structures of it that make the joint which is two bones moving in relation to each other, basically. Yeah. We can actually divide the structures into passive, which is what you said, cartilage, the bones, the bones touching each other or the cartilage in between, obviously. Yeah. And the ligaments around them that actually keep it together and hold it. Yeah. And then we have the active components, which are the muscles and the tendons that relate to the muscles and attach the muscles. And they are really, really important for the simple reason that they are the ones who actually then also actively contract and control the muscle or, or the joints, I'm sorry. They control the joints when you move. And when you put yeah. weight on that joint, the muscles are the ones that actually make the joint move in a yeah. controlled manner. And now if they don't fire when they should do in the right relation to each other, or if they don't have the strength or if they just don't function as they should. The issues within the joint, so the osteoarthritis, actually may get worse or it is less manageable yeah. because the active components, the muscles and the tendons and the other soft tissue structures don't work as they should do. Yeah. And therefore, their force production may be weaker or there may be several different issues that may... Yeah. So I think a lot of people that have listened to us, we talk about joint instability as being a cause and a progressive factor in arthritis. And, um, you know, the, the joints are, are, are designed to be moved in a certain way. You know, they've got their routine. It's a routine movement. And then if that instability comes and plays a role, you get an abnormal movement and those tissues weren't designed to use like that. So they get worn out quicker. And if they get worn out, you start this cartilage degradation and these changes within the joint. Bingo, arthritis. Yes. Um, so in the prevention of it, but mm. even when you get it, it's really mm. important to rehabilitate appropriately so that you can at least manage it when it is there. So yes. I can't say it's never too late, you know, but, but I would like to say that it's never too late to do something. So yes. even if you didn't manage to prevent it for whatever reason it is there, at least then we should do something about it to try to manage it. Yeah. But it's, but it's really important, these different components that relate to the joint and the function of the joint. Yeah. And I think because I I'm I'm not a physio and I I've just got a real passion about this area and it, you know my learning pathway was like holy cow I never thought like this before and when I started realizing you know that joints have such a such an intricate as you say firing of different things to allow joint function and stability and propulsion if you've got fat infiltrating into these structures and they lose that pizzazz, mm. they unstabilize, the, the, you know, they, they unbalance the ship in action and then you start getting abnormal movements, you get pain, you get progression. So that's what we're trying to talk about, guys. I hope you're still with us. Come on, guys. We want some, we want some interaction here. Lynn, I'm watching you. You need to interact. Um, also... So it's not only that if they fire or not, there's another aspect from the tendon point of view. 
like I said earlier, healing may be affected, mm -hmm. but also what people often report is stiffness. And actually there are studies telling us how the tendons actually don't work as they should. They start having different structural changes and mm -hmm. tendons from the biomechanical point of view are really, really important for the dog's movement. So there's a direct mm -hmm. impact also from that point of view. So even if there wouldn't be osteoarthritis yet, but if the dog is really obese, it will not move the same way, even from the point of view of, of very basic tendon structure. Yeah, actually, if you wouldn't mind, can you explain to them about tendon storing energy and allowing movement? Because that's something that I didn't get taught. Well, I, was, I certainly didn't listen in the lecture at uni. Oh. <laughs> Whatever I was doing, I wasn't listening that day. And um, okay. I learned it later in my career. So explain to people about that. Okay, well, I'll try to be very brief because I tend to get a bit excited about this. Mm -hmm. So basically, we talk about two mechanisms of moving forward. If the dog wants to go from A to B, how will it do it? It has basically two options. It can either walk or run. Mm -hmm. When it walks, it uses the so-called inverted pendulum mechanism, okay. which is, at least in Finland, all the old grandmas have uh, big wall clocks with the pendulum going like that. Do you guys have yeah. those? Yeah. yeah. It goes tick, tuck, tick, tuck. So yeah. literally, is if you turn that pendulum around and it keeps going like that, tick, yeah. tick, tuck. It's all about the little flap at the end of the pendulum. Yeah. It's a mass. Its yeah. function is to be a mass because the mass will keep it going from side to another, right? Yeah. Same way you walk. So it's yeah. all about moving the center of the mass. Right. But in the inverted pendulum mechanism, basically the mass of the dog is in the middle of the pen the mass of the pendulum. Yeah. The dog's center of mass is in a it's underneath the thoracic spine, somewhere in the rib cage, depending which breed we are looking at. But it's there. Like we have a center of mass. So basically what you do, I don't know where to put my hand so you can see it. Well. Okay. So this is my pendulum, okay? Yeah. In the what? In the clock that has been turned upside down. And yeah. on the dog, this would be the limb of a dog. Yeah. Right? And here is the mass center of the mass of the dog. Yeah. What the dog does, it puts it frontly forward, and then the mass of the dog is left a little bit behind in relation to that limb and it yeah. pushes the mass over that limb and then the second one comes and takes the mass yeah it just keeps on pendulum motioning the center of the mass forward Does so that it kind of uses the weight to enact yeah. yeah. and it uses its limbs like a hook basically if you look at the dog walk the limbs don't give in that much they are quite Stick quite yeah. stiff. That's the word. Yeah, yeah. Does yeah. That makes sense. I know it's it does. It's much more of a, a, a less energy requiring. Yeah. It will just go wing, wong, wing, wong, and just keep moving the legs under the mass that goes up and down and up and down and up and yeah. down. It's just like old men when they walk around with hands behind their backs and they're like, walk, walk, walk. I'm be so conscious of that now when I'm walking. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what they do. So that's okay. walking. Then the other option is to run. And it makes no difference which gate. Forget the gate. You either walk or you run. Yeah. If the dog, you know, he's walking along, pendulum, ding, ding, yeah. ding, ding. And suddenly, <gasps> a rabbit and he has to shoot, shoot behind the rabbit so obviously he won't go quick 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 it makes no <laughs> sense it's not energy efficient it's not fast enough and it looks really silly so yeah what the dog does is he actually switches on spring mass model doesn't it look co sound cool i think that sounds cool yes and if you look at dogs le legs or limbs especially let's say a greyhound when they run if you look at them, they'll actually give in. They are like springs. So when the yeah. dog comes on the leg, 
hits the ground and basically pushes its weight on the legs. It compresses it down, 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 down. And at that moment, all the energy that is in the movement is stored into the tendons. Yeah. The very important tendons without the lipids in them. Without the lipids in them. Yes. So all the tendons are actually storing the energy. As when the weight is on the dog, it's compressing, compressing, and then it releases the energy and jumps like springs. And when it releases the energy, it makes the body move forward. Yes. So that's your there strategy. you go. So this is why tendons. Muchos importantes. Yeah, exactly. Without the lipids. Without the fat in them, guys. Yes. Okay, so is that okay, everybody happy. I think I just I, I just you. love you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you guys, I listened to her and I was I think I was probably eating a biscuit in a cup of tea. I was like, I'm just gonna put this down and I'm just gonna absorb this. Mm. Um so it is, let's... it's actually really, really cool. And that's the way you guys also walk and run. Yeah, it's, it's the same mechanism. Horses are even better at this, but let's not talk about them today. It's all about doggies. But those yeah. are the two kind of mechanisms that we are thinking about. Okay, cool. Cool. Right. Now that we've got that in the bag, let's throw in the whole concept of what joints are asked to do when they're carrying more weight. And as much as you were like blown away with the findings of this Brady's paper and how it was not what you expected. Mm. Like I, I've I've read the paper and I was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. So explain to them what I'm talking about. Start from the beginning. I'm just going to let you go. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, like I said in the beginning, there are not that many papers on obesity and biomechanics. In there. there are a couple, and one of them is written by Brady and others, um, and it is. <sighs> How do you guys say earth shattering? Is that the word? It is. It is earth shattering. It yeah, is. yeah, yeah. And I'll put, I'll put a link after tonight. I'll put yeah. a link up so people can go and read it. Yes, because it is really, really important. It's actually not. It's only 2013 published paper, so yeah. it is quite recent. And honestly, I honestly have to say I have nothing to do with this research. I did not do it, but I'm a big, big fan of this article. I think every people, every person should read it. And yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know that when I have read it, I literally have cried. Yeah. I, and every yeah. time, even now, I've read it like thousands of times and I, it still makes me want to cry because yeah. to be a physiotherapist and to get that information from that paper, which will tell you more in just a yeah. second, but it is really, really, really important. And it yeah. really puts emphasis on why this is so severe. Why so severe. should not be obese? Yeah. Um, we often talk about, uh, and I think everybody knows, like every person knows that walking on asphalt is not good. And you shouldn't be obese because when you walk around, if you're obese, there is more impact on your joints. Every yeah. step you take, if you, even if you wouldn't be obese, even if you carry, um, what is 100 kilos in your pounds? It's like, is 100 pounds a lot? 220 pounds? Is it? So let's say if you carry 220 pounds of rocks in your back, and you decide yeah. to run a kilometer on asphalt, you know that your feet will be <laughs> short. They will be shorter. <laughs> and every step you take, the pounding your knee joints take is horrific. The more yeah. weight you add on, the more it hits. That's one yeah. of the messages in this paper. They have put numbers on it. They have measured dogs who are obese in comparison to dogs who are not. And they are looking at the differences in the amounts of forces. Needless yeah. to say, the heavier the dog, the bigger the impact, the actual yeah. 
heat on the joint. And what was yeah, lovely, yeah. just to briefly interrupt, that what was lovely about the paper is it was a really well constructed trial. It had reasonably good numbers for a vet study. It had force plate analysis, so it had visual, um, numerical force plates. It had a wide variety of measures of lameness, blah blah blah. It it and it um it was consistent and it was it was really well thought out of, wasn't it? So they had force plate and they also put little markers on different joints of the dog and they used video cameras from different angles watching joint movement. So cleverly done. But yeah, as you say, so a lot of people will understand about weight creating a force that goes through the joint and that's where their brain then stops yeah add to it yeah the other part in the paper that i obviously this is in itself this already is really really important yeah. but then the other part that to me as a physiotherapist actually is possibly even scarier yeah the fact that like you said they measured the movements of the joints looking at the different movement if different joints moving when the dogs were performing yeah. and what they found out was the dogs who are heavier and i'm we're not going to go through the degrees here um you can all read them later on because that would be just too time consuming but let me say that the difference between a obese in other words, overweight dog, in comparison to a lean dog of same breed, the difference in the range of motion of the joints during when they are moving, and this is also during the weight bearing, yeah. is really, really significant. And it's not only like, in, often in research, we read papers and it says, oh, it's statistically significant. And sometimes yeah. you look at it and you go, yeah, dude, that's like <laughs> that no degree. Like, I like a, no. a cheat chin. I'm not perfect. Like, oh, really? Like, who cares if it's <laughs> one millionth of a degree? But here, yeah. the numbers are such that everybody understands that they yeah. are really so what we like to call clinically significant. They yeah. have an so, impact in, they are. And actually, from other studies, we know that, for example, physiotherapists in humans can estimate range of motion of a joint, let's say a knee joint, even as precisely as with five degrees. Yeah. And some of these joints move more than six or, or uh, sorry, seven or even 10 degrees. Yeah. That's something you can actually see with your eye. Yeah. And why that is really important to me, like I was saying as a physiotherapist, the idea of, can I, can I just, just a second? Yeah, 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 go for it. We want to see your armpit. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. It's, it's early <laughs> in Finland. We're not there yet. <laughs> so let's go back to the joint. <laughs> let's say that this is the stifle, so the yeah. knee of the dog. Yeah. And basically, this is what it is supposed to do. So the dog is standing on it yeah. and then walking, and it's supposed to do that. Okay. Yeah. But when it's standing, the idea is that the weight comes on the joint and then and it stays and holds. Yeah. And then the weight goes off and it moves like so and, yeah. so, and yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if we look at the results of this study, in different joints and they've looked at elbow and shoulder even more challenging but yeah. what happens is you actually get uh, hmm, during yeah. the weight bearing when you're supposed to go <laughs> you yeah. suddenly get more movement yeah. and it's not actually stable and and yeah. held by whatever active components or whatever does it i don't know but what I do know is that they move when the weight is on. So first the joint gets the move from the yeah. end. You're too heavy and your joints have to take the hit. So there will be a two. And then it's... Yeah. Yeah. Get and that, guys. Can you imagine that cartilage and all the tissues going... Oof, and then, oh, wiggle around a little bit. <laughs> so that really isn't optimal. Really, really isn't. 
no. and reason for it and how to tackle this thing. And clearly, you always have to think if they're, you know, the other ones don't move at all. And the other yeah. ones move like, let's say, 10 degrees more during the weight bearing. You first of all have to come up with which is normal and which is not. So obviously, it's normal to be more stable. And it is not normal to move so much. So we're not happy with the great movement. Do we call it instability? Do we, what, what's the reason for it? Is it just the weight or is it then lack of power in relation to the weight? There are a lot of different things we have to then consider when we rehabilitate these patients. Um, and this is just to rewind, just to rewind a bit. I just want to, I just want people because they're probably like going, "Whoa, I'm, I think I'm with us. I think I'm with them. I'm not 100 percent sure." When you read this paper, you'll realize that the the range of motion of, say, the elbow or the shoulder has increased dramatically through carrying weight. So instead of um, having what you suspect would happen when you carry weight, which your joint angle your joint movement would possibly reduce because you imagine people that are carrying too much weight would be stiffer and slower and they wouldn't move so much through their joints very common in humans but in dogs their joints are asked more of with a range of motion and we're not talking as Heli was saying a couple of degrees we're talking a vast amount mm. and what really stood out for me because I got into CAM because of massage and um having a sudden appreciation of how important soft tissue was. And as soon as I read that, I was thinking, well, what the hell is trying to counteract it? So if a joint is used to doing, say, a range of motion of, say, 60 degrees, and suddenly it's being asked to do 75, there are other structures going, good God, <laughs> you want another 15 degrees for me to prevent? You know, mm. and I'm thinking all these muscles going, mm. <laughs> Yeah. Try it not to allow that range of motion because it's not normal. It's not allowed. I'm trying to stop it. And then you start thinking of all of these muscles that are overworking, trying to counter. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, muscles overworking, myalgia, muscle pain, tension, discomfort, you know. And I just then start looking at these dogs thinking, this is just carrying weight must lead to pain. I'm I'm sorry, yeah. I just can't imagine it doesn't. I know. Even you got arthritis, you know. Do I have to something? Sorry. No. no. You got You're absolutely correct. And there's another thing. Difference between obese human and obese dog, from yeah. my point of view, as a physiotherapist interested about the movement today, humans stand on straight legs. I mean, your yeah. leg is like that. You yeah. are eating away the joints just as the dog is it's not yeah. good but the dogs have angulations in their joint yeah. so they need to hold those positions with the overweight hanging on them yeah. so it is from the active components that i was saying the muscles and the tendons it is a different position where they start from and they need to uphold those angulations with that extra weight on and it is not yeah. fair and it's exactly the same i'll jump very briefly if i can to the back <laughs> because also humans again are with their obese torso we are so-called vertical we are on top of the straight legs and yeah. it's, it's not good for your back it's not good for your joints but they are straight whereas at least they're dog, stacked. yeah they are stacked but the dog is actually horizontal with their backs so all the fat that hangs from their tummies and whatever they have is actually hanging from their backs all the time yeah. so the, the gravity gravity is pulling them down the, the can i say fat i'm sorry it's another word but the fatter they are the more the gravity pulls them down so yeah. their backs are also under huge just think what it's doing to a vertebrae it's stacking the it's pushing the facet joints oh. into each other oh. instead of them working with each other they're being shoved together and you just sit there going wow this is having a massive domino effect and when the dog moves actually from the point of view of the back if you've ever go to youtube and look search for a slow motion greyhound 
and you'll yeah. see amazing videos of greyhounds how they curl into this like absolute ball with the legs to cross each other and then yeah. they launch into full extension with the legs in front and back and that's the way they should work and some breeds don't do that much let's say you have an english bulldog i'm pretty sure it won't curl that much because it's not built that way from the point of view of conformation but every dog's spine should be able to move and it's really sad if you have a greyhound who has a back like that there's no curling you know so there are lots and lots of let's say species typical functions that their spines and limbs should be able to do mm. but sometimes sometimes obesity just prevents it no no and i so, i went i was really lucky i went out to india a few years back and um i went out there to go and do massage and dogs amazing it's an awesome experience garden my therapy thank you very much and um there was a real trend over there to have western breeds in quite intense cities where there wasn't walking you know facilities they were living in high-rise flats all of them had you know five six staircases to get to these marble floored i said it marble floor flats and these dogs were hugely overweight they weren't exercise and they had no core stability their backs were just dipped and you sit there going oh gosh will help you know, no, 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 no. But I want to say one thing about massage whilst we are here. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm sure some of your previous visitors have said it already, but like I said, I have extra adipose tissue so I can freely talk about this and I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you massage an obese dog, please, please be gentle with them. The fat mm -hmm. tissue can be very very painful indeed right no that's a really good point yeah just no, see, a... if they don't like it it could be just because you're squeezing the adipose mm. tissue and i will never ever ever in my life let anyone massage my thighs end of really? <laughs> so i've never yeah. really thought about it well maybe you don't have to think about it but like i said we're in lockdown, love. No one's massaging my thighs if I ask them. So, <laughs> mm. um, well, moving on. Yes, <laughs> moving on. Um, so let's go back to like this range of motion thing. Yes. Yeah. Something that you said, amongst saying how upset it was, it made you mm. kind of want to keep the fact that even just standing and moving, they were having to put so much more energy to counteract this extra flexion and extension. Um. You also talk about, as a physio, you feel that there is some hope that you can affect ground reaction forces. So that's the actual weight going through the joint because you can change the surface on what they walk. You can change the activity that they do. You can change the tempo of the gait that they're walking at. And you know that you can actually have some impact on that reaction force um, because we know that the faster they go, the heavier the weight through those joints. So we could say, right for you next six to eight weeks we're only walking and i only want you to walk on grass and i do not want your dog to be doing any pavement work and stop the trots walk at their pace mm. but what you say is as a physio trying to counteract that increased range of motion those joints are going through is what can you do yeah it's also noteworthy that the paper that we are referring to brady's paper uh they also noticed differences during the swing phase so not when the weight is on the leg but when it's swinging to the next weight bearing mm -hmm. phase. so there were changes throughout the movement the obese dogs seem to move biomechanically very different from the leaner dogs mm -hmm. um and like you say what to do <laughs> what to do i know and that well, exactly going... what you said from the stance phase point of view well from both of the phases actually another thing that is really important obviously the first thing is to get rid of the weight mm. but please please do not go running marathons to get the weight down because you will break the dog when it's obese it's it's actually an art form or actually it's a form of science <laughs> mm. 
Mm. How we do it safely, get the weight down, is the only answer to it in the long run. Mm. There has to be consideration to how it's done, the amount, the tempo, the intensity of it all. Like you said, the surfaces where they walk on. But it's also not only about getting the weight off. Often people seem to think that it's weight down and lots of muscle. Power! It's all about yeah, power. Yeah. You actually do nothing with the power if you can't control it. Yes. So we need to pay attention to what we call motor control. And it's yeah. a really, really important aspect of moving. Because... Um, do you know the way I think everybody's seen those handsome and huge big men and women who do bodybuilding yeah. are like built like a barn door you know and they have you ever seen actually them do anything functional <laughs> and they run rarely not the biggest ones at all do they turn around and just knock everything off everywhere yes well, you know the way they move they are really stiff and I actually once had a friend who did a lot of that and he was actually unable to hold his own, I almost said feet, on, on human they are the hands. He couldn't yeah. hold his hands up to put a curtain rail on a window because it takes too much effort because they are so heavy. So he yeah. has a huge amount of power that he's unable to use for another yeah. reason. <laughs> but But... You know, force alone isn't anything, or power alone isn't anything. Okay. So it's motor control. And also, if we think that the dog is obese and there is already some inflammatory processes going on in the joints, there is most probably pain in there. Pain affects how you learn, what you learn. Pain affects, it inhibits the use of muscles or the use of the joint or you know, you learn different compensatory patterns, which in dogs is really, really common. They are like masters of compensation, which is one of the reasons how they can actually hide their symptoms for quite a long time from the owners. Because they, you know, they have four legs and they can just compensate whichever way they want to mm -hmm. until they reach the limit when they can't anymore. Yeah. Anyway, so it's all about um, teaching them how to move pain-free and appropriately, and that is a really important part of the whole process of rehabilitation as part of weight management. Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, I don't think I gave you an opportunity to finish talking about all the possible thoughts behind this increased range of motion. And as you say, you were talking about how they have more horizontally placed limbs rather than stacking vertically like we do. So if you imagine the femur going through the knee into the tibia, it's a very vertical stacked joint. Dogs are like this. You've got vectors to play here. Um, so there's one fat thought, but also there is the consideration that if they're not as motor active, mm. they started to lose some proprioceptive kind of qualities. Mm. So Maybe they're not realizing that their joints are going through a wider range of motion. So when you're trying to encourage people to start shifting that weight, don't let them just free fall and do their own thing because they will go for the quickest, most aggressive way to lose yeah. weight. And they believe it's about running. Yeah. So what we need to do is actually really guide them and talk about four pace walking, you know, walk to heel, you know, put some obstacle, gentle, easy, navigatable obstacles. You know, this is where our pole work this is our changing textures of environment, mm -hmm. but not stomping pavements at high speed, running along against the person that's on COVID lockdown, trying to lose weight themselves. You know, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, you've gone. You'll come back. Let me just get her back. We had a little bit of a glitch there. Two seconds, guys. So as you can see, me and um, Heli, we have a lot of passion about this area. Um, let me just text her. Oh, hopefully she'll be back in two seconds. Um, any questions whilst I wait for her to come back? Um, come back. Come back. Cool, I've just texted her. Does the range of movement return to normal post weight loss or is this permanently charged? As far as I know, there aren't any studies, but we would assume so. You're coming back up, Heli, hopefully. Yeah, there you are. 
I could hear you all the time. I have no clue why it threw me out. Maybe I was getting a bit too excited. Yeah, I think Live are telling us to calm down. Yeah. Uh, so I just answered Laura's question. Does the range of movement return to normal post weight loss or is this permanently changed? We, we do don't you? know. I don't know. But what I do know is something. I have a note. I have a note because I wanted to say this. Wait, wait. Because I never do notes. So this is me doing notes. Because what we do know, just a second, give me a second because I want to say this and I made a note, so we need to use my note. Ha! Huh. If there is, if there is Lynn, this is from a study from, this is Marshall and others in 2010. And the paper yeah. was the effect of weight loss on lameness in obese dogs with osteoarthritis. Oh, that's a good paper. Yes. With 6 to 9% weight reduction, lameness in dogs, if they had lameness before, it actually decreased. Yeah. The weight yeah. reduction does have an impact, honestly, even in like... It was, it was a really good study because that was the that's the one that they did the lameness which was visual numerical and yeah. force play. I yeah. got confused and what was interesting in that one a six percent weight loss was seen on the numerical and the visual so the owner observation but it took to eight percent weight loss before it really showed itself in the force play. but um so let's Lindsay Tyndale where are you you had a question would hydro therefore be a better option yes thank you who was it who was it lindsay, lindsay. i won't say her nickname okay <laughs> hello lindsay definitely again one of my notes this is why i don't do notes because i never remember to look at them so in my notes it actually said that when we do the um, when we start doing physiotherapy as part of obesity management mm -hmm. water exercises are one big thing but then one has to be very careful as to thinking because you basically you can do underwater treadmill or swimming those are your two main options but it is very individual as to which one to do and with obesity like discussed in the beginning of our discussion was discussed in discussion anyways like said in the beginning of discussion was that there are also cardiac issues related to obesity there are other diseases yes. respiratory function may be actually uh mm -hmm. difficult for the dog so maybe swimming is not at all the safe thing to do and there mm -hmm. are lots of different things i'll do another speak on hydrotherapy someday but anyways oh yeah no definitely You've got a big fan already. Look at this one. Ready? Um, you're going to like this. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, water, good. Just you need to know how and what. But yeah, 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 definitely. But and I think it's kind of a little bit sad for people that don't have access to it. So don't, if you haven't got access to underwater treadmill, if you haven't got access to swimming, don't be disheartened. There's many ways you can rehabilitate these dogs you can manage the weight without the water obviously i come yeah. from finland which is i think officially we are known as the country of million lakes or whatever so summertime just use the natural waters you don't need to pay for it heaven's sake so if you guys happen to have a lake in uk nearby you yeah. use it or wherever you are but it's always yeah. good to go i would say contact your physiotherapist mm -hmm. and get appropriate individual advice as to how to use the water for the benefit of the dog so that it's first and foremost safe but also yes. efficient yeah and on that little note if any um sorry luna keeps moving if anybody is watching from where i live at the moment so i'm in st boswell's in um the borders in scotland and we have a lot of clients that come to see me and they say oh yeah the dog loves going in the river tweed and i'm sitting there going have you seen the bottom of the tweed it's just slimy stones sorry that's luna it's just slimy stones on the bottom of this riverbed and you can just see these dogs dashing out and their legs are going in such horrible directions getting caught between the rocks you can see them really in 
quite an amazing brain state. They wouldn't feel a thing. It was not until they come home, they go, well, that knee went the wrong direction during that. Mm. So be aware about where you're asking them to go into the water. Just a couple of questions. Mm. Sorry. Can I just say one thing also about even if you do swim or walking in water in natural water, we are now talking about rehabilitative physiotherapy, swimming or walking in water. This is not your healthy, fit, sporting dog swimming around. This is now no dashing around, no jumping on the slimy stones. There are rules as to how you enter the water, how we behave in the water, how long you're there, what's I mean, there are there is a program for you how it should be done, and it's not yeah. just throw the dog in the water and take it out when it's all panting and everything. Just yeah. no, this needs to be structured. Yeah, and for any UK hydrotherapist, because we've got a big UK hydrotherapist following, which is fantastic, and I know that they um, there's a lot of skill that goes into hydrotherapy. So I'm getting to do it at work quite a lot now, and there is a lot of skill as a hydrotherapist being in the tank doing lots and lots of activities um, and being able to observe and act to change what heli is talking about is a completely different thing to what you would get from a physio or hydrotherapist in a tank but if you don't have access to a tank or a pool if you don't have that then doing very controlled walking in water can offer some benefit it's I got told off once for calling it hydrotherapy and I do totally respect where that person was coming from now because there's a lot of skill into doing hydrotherapy properly. But if you are somebody that owns a very overweight dog and you're some part of America that has no access to any of these facilities and you want to slowly increase your dog's exercise quotient without having these huge impact forces and you have got access to safe, easy entrance, easy access of water um, that you can walk with them in, not lobby, it's not lob by um, balls, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a good option. Um, a sensible question from Laura Eldred. When the dog loses weight, do the lipids come out, the tendons, ligaments, muscles, and does the structure return to the normal composition? Laura is a physio. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do you have that answer? Uh, I actually... Now, the teacher and scientist in me says, can I get back to this via the Facebook page later on? Because I want to check something before I say anything. Okay, we'll come back to you on that one then, Laura. Yeah, I w I, um, if you're happy with that, Laura. Because I, I, yes. I, have, an, I have a brilliant answer, but I w don't want to let it come out from my mouth before I have my references. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> And I think it will probably answer her previous question, which was up here about um, if there are increased lipids in ligament structure, mm. would oh. influence increase the risk of cruciate disease? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think there's been any studies. No. Uh, because what you would actually have to do is histopathologically look at the ligaments. And would you be able to do that in dogs that had had a ruptured cruciate and they took some away and they sent it away and they looked at it? But then quite often a lot of the cruciates that we see that have ruptured, they are actually ligaments that are free floating, doing nothing for a while. So is the mm. lipid accumulation later or was it actually involved in the yeah. event? I think that's quite a hard one. And I don't personally know of any studies, no. but I do that will know if they exist i'll ask karen perry butler if she knows yeah. anything um yeah i would i wouldn't answer it as no. a clear-cut answer okay good right we had topics to cover uh, oh, oh yes so we've been warming up so far so let's go through the topic <laughs> <laughs> well we're already 53 minutes in um i did write notes today guys yeah. so we talked about the range of motion. We talked about the difference with humans. We talked about the laxity, and we talked about the actual lipid involvement into the tissue motion and the instability that can come from it. We know instability is not our friend. We've talked about the fact that this instability has to be counteracted by the muscles around. Say it. Just no, say you, it. you read the list, and then I'll say. I'll write it down so I won't forget. Um. We've talked about comorbidities, pro-inflammatory state, da -da 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 -da. 
I next topic is going to be how can we impress the importance and how can we help the people that have listened to this to take it away and start talking to their mates about it. So tell me what you wanted to say. I wanted to say one more thing because I got a bit carried away earlier. We were talking about power and force alone is nothing. You need to be able to control it. You need to have motor yeah. control. You need to, you know, fine tune your movements. And I want yeah. to say one thing because this leads me into skill, lack of skill possibly in movement. You know, the dogs who go around or oh, what we would say, yeah. oh, he's a bit clumsy. He's funny that way, you know, or maybe actually he's not skilled in his movement because this might be jumping into conclusions but if i have if i see a very obese dog one has to wonder if it hasn't been moving that much and you need to move to learn to move to get the skill mm -hmm. of movement to be skilled in your move if you want to be a ballerina which i wanted to do when I was a child. Obviously, my mother <laughs> took me to judo. Oh, so, no. Anyway, <laughs> any scars, is it? No. one would want to be a, a very skilled ballerina, it would take you hours upon hours upon hours of practice of yeah. control and you know everything for you to have a skill to move that way. So yeah. there's a lot more to the way they should be moving and, and the amount of movement it's not just, you know, you need to move to burn energy to get rid of the fat. Mm. You also need to move to be skilled in your movement. Quality of totally agree. too. And I can, I can totally relate to that at the moment. So with the whole COVID crisis and everybody's either turning into two personality types, either sit at home and eat chips or suddenly decide that you're going to be really active mm. and maximize your daily quotient. So I've gone back to running and I've noticed that my ankles almost roll a little bit more. So when I'm running on uneven terrain, I haven't got the same stability mm -hmm. in my lower limb. I don't counteract myself like I used, used to. And that will be that my motor skills yeah. have lost. They're, 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 they're yeah. tuning in, their reactivity. Yeah. I know there was something that you mentioned that I need to mention about the severely obese dogs when the actual fat becomes a mechanical barrier to movement yeah. oh yes yes that's actually that is one of the saddest things because mm. well i'm pretty sure we've all seen dogs lick their bums or their testicles <laughs> and it's totally. really important to them i mean i don't know why but if 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 one is a male dog, it needs to lick its balls, basically. It's it's a behavior for them that is important. But at the same time, it is actually really good of mobility exercise to the thoracolumbar spine, activating muscles in their tummy to get themselves into those positions. Yeah. And then you have a dog who is so obese that it literally cannot flex yeah, the mechanical block. It's looking yeah. at its testicles and crying because it, it can never reach them and it's not normal you know no, no. some dogs are so obese that they can't gallop yeah you know and they are yeah. just too fat so that actually their tummy is so big that when their hind leg is trying to move forward it just can't because it hits the yeah. tummy so they they and they kind of they try to swing around don't yeah. they yeah and they start throwing them from outside to get them forward and it's 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 really really sad and it sometimes really sad. you see those videos on the funniest home videos programs and everything and it, it's like oh how funny and how cute and it's actually that if anything makes me cry it's there's yeah. nothing funny about it but we no. see more and more of those dogs because the view of what is normal weight or what is acceptable. Uh, this is just, there's no research. This is from my clinical experience, but yeah. it seems to change. What yeah. you, the way we like to score the condition of dogs is from zero to nine. I think you guys use the yeah. same. Yeah, yeah, we the same. And we usually say that around four out of nine is your normalish. Yeah. And these days, it seems that six or seven is the new four. 
it's like acceptable that looks normal and then you have hunting dogs or racing greyhounds or whippets who are in really lean absolutely optimal yeah. condition like i shake when i see them because they are like oh so ooh, cool and what dog should be and these yeah. owners sometimes tell me that they have people coming to them on the street complaining that their dogs are emaciated yeah. and they get really bad feedback if you don't have enough money to feed your dog you shouldn't have a dog yeah and their dog is normal not that totally. three points <laughs> fatter so i think that's totally. also a really really sad thing that our eyes are actually calibrated to see and there is there is actually um there are there are reviews polls to support that so um as for evidence to support what you're saying nine out of ten owners of overweight dogs cannot see it because they're so swayed but what normal looks like so i'll have people come to me and they'll say well he's made the fine way and i'm like so who do you cross compare to well, other dogs in the park well if all the other dogs are overweight as well and your dog is slightly not as overweight you're going to go my dog's okay my dog's lean compared so um this is where the next topic and there's a little bit of feedback so i do apologize how can we impress the importance and how can we start actioning change so go back to the beginning of this Facebook Live. Helly's here for us to add this added layer to encourage people to action change. And the two things that we need to do is A, develop the confidence to actually approach people and say, I want to help you. Your dog is overweight. What can we do? How can we tackle that? But also, how can we get the owners to keep seeing that their dog is overweight on a daily basis? Just stick to the plan. To get the weight off and i love um client specific outcome measures for chronic pain indicators and i think we can take a lot from that so i use client specific outcome measures because i know every day that owner is reminded that their dog's got a condition that needs monitoring and action there might be a changed exercise regime it might be a changed lifestyle it might be medication it might be supplements it might be physio whatever it is because they see it they do it so we now need to teach owners to see it and feel it to do something about it. And that's why when I read the papers and I watched your webinar, I felt it. I felt sorry for these dogs. I felt pain. I felt those muscles trying to counteract that range of motion. I felt what those joints must feel like when they're running on them and they wobble. And um, the, 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 the imbalance, you know, running and not knowing if your legs are secure you know the pain of the extra forces going through those joints that inflammatory state those burning joints and i felt sad mm. i really hope that we as cam the cam collective all of you guys are part of cam um the followers that you know the cambassadors how can we start a trend to stop this because it's not working what we're doing now. Levels of obesity and weight carriage is going up, going up, going up. And we've got lots of people trying to instigate change and it's not working. So what are we going to do? What do you think? Is that a question for me? How would you care? What's, what's, what? I, I actually, sadly, I don't know. But I think this is also, I think this is also a bigger question because we have the same trend, don't we, with humans? Mm. And it all it all comes from humans. We are mm. the ones who feed the dogs and we are the ones who shove the stuff down our own mouths. It's that's it. The dog will eat. Most dogs will eat whatever you give to them. <laughs> so, mm. You know, they'll eat whatever and as much as you give them. It is our responsibility each and every individual i have a very fit dog which i'm proud of but i can also say that i have an obese dog which i'm not at all proud of and it is a struggle to keep him in good shape mm -hmm. and not obese it really is a struggle so i do feel for every owner who has an obese dog 
And, you know, some dogs, if you say the word food, <laughs> they took on two kilos. It just, honestly, that is the way he's, and I do understand and believe every owner who says that we do everything and yet. Mm. However, I'm pretty sure no one has done everything because mm. it is quite simple laws of, not laws of physics, but physiology. Metabolic. Yeah. The the proportions of intake and output, basically. <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's not, you know, and obviously there are then dogs who have diseases, and that's a different thing. But if we just talk about basic normal um environment and management related obesity, it is down mm -hmm. to humans. We need to control what we feed our dogs. It needs to be high quality, obviously, it needs to be sufficient but it shouldn't be overfeeding the dogs. They they don't need treats. They yeah. just don't need treats. I, I would totally agree. That is, that is oh. us, isn't it? Yeah. I think also what I have definitely found in my line of work is not trendy. Being, being the clinician that is really buzzed up about obesity is still not got this kind of like academic trendiness to it you know it's oh i'm going to put them on this combination of medications for their pain and lose some weight and they don't understand how complex weight loss can be you know you're dealing with the social situation of the owner the psychology of the owner the you know keeping that owner motivated trying to shift weight from a dog that doesn't lose it easily you've got the dog factors to consider it's very very complex mm. and Hey, Nikki. I'm Nikki Turchis here. Watch out, everybody. Gin and tonic, Sunday evening. Oh. Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> we need to change. We need to change people's um, attitude. Towards mm. Definitely. Well, it's, a, it's a sideline conversation that doesn't get enough attention. And I am going to name drop now. Um, I've listened to some of Duncan LaSalle's lectures recently. Mm. I'm really impressed because however complicated pain is and he is like a god of pain he understands such detail you know inflammatory pathways and new medications that come out every time he talks he goes why are we not talking about weight it is a mm. game you know that more attention needs to be paid to it mm. so there's got to be a change in the way that we talk about it which is going to mm. be the next part of this talk mm. is how do we start the conversation Yes. Can I also say, as a physio, it's actually easy for me. That mm. part is easy because it's my job. And people who come to me know that. That is the assumption. Uh, can I say something? There is a lady called Sarah Renison who said that feed should be relative to activity levels and calorie input versus calorie burned. Yeah. yeah. And that is also a very, very important point. And from, again, coming from a physio, activity and movement appropriate on that level for that dog at the moment considering the weight that it is carrying yeah but it's not it's obviously easy to control what they eat but then it's also getting ourselves up and moving the dog as much as it needs to move to burn burn those calories appropriately um so yeah definitely an important thing and the discussion about how to say it Mm. You said earlier, like we had discussed, that it's really people do take. I I'm a human physio to begin with, mm. and then I've specialized on animal physio. And I can honestly say that from my experience, people take it easier if you tell them that they are obese and something needs to be done. Mm. It is much harder to hear that your dog is obese and something needs yeah. to be done. No, no, it's true. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say the only two formal complaints, they sound like little Miss Goody Two Shoes, but the, um, the only two proper formal complaints I've had in my 18 year career have been about weight because they haven't wanted to hear what I've said. And unfortunately, I'm going to be quite cruel to my colleagues over the years. The reason they took it so badly is no one else had said anything before. Mm. So to see a new vet in the practice who's pretty um, about weight control but for three four years of vaccinations before mm. people just slip so as an industry and as a pet professional it doesn't matter who you are vet nurse dog walker groomer physiotherapist 
we all need to be singing from the same song sheet because we stitch mates up by saying so. Yeah. I wouldn't have but also, that other people have mentioned it. Yeah, but I, I have to say, I've been lucky also. I know that it's more difficult to take the info, to, to have the discussion about your dog's obesity than your own. Mm. But maybe because I've been educated from the very beginning to have difficult conversations with people. And mm. I think most, we have to remember that the people I meet are a certain type of people. They've already engaged. Yes, because they come to physiotherapy. They know it already. They, yeah. they are prepared. You know, it's, I live in this lovely pink bubble of lovely people who have yeah. lovely dogs. Some of them are obese and some are not. But, you know, it's, it's not a problem for me, but I do understand why it could be for someone. And for a vet, for example, you, you're in the front line. I get the ones who you already talked to and referred to yeah. me. So, you know, you did no. all the dirty work. Well, the, the front line at the moment are the ambassadors. Um, can I just have a saver a moment for just a moment? Oh. Thanks. Do you know what? That means something. <laughs> I really wanted to meet this Lindsay person now. Oh, I'll tell you all about her later. Um, yeah. So no, it, it is something that I think really, um, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I feel that as an industry as a whole, we need to start growing a pair and being able to have these conversations. And, and we need to have some kind of education about having difficult conversations. And um, Lynn, you're totally right. I'm going to start looking around for people to come in and help educate us how to have difficult conversations. It's needed. And Nick, also, if I think one thing is EBG for us to have these conversations. Let's get them out there because your following need to hear about this as well. So, sorry. Continue. No, I was just supposed to say that I also think the owner pays for my professional opinion of the state of the dog at the moment. So obviously the main problem, physiotherapy problem is obesity. It needs to be addressed, but it's mm. exactly like you say, how to say it, not to offend anyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is another thing that I think is really important. Um, Daisy Daisy. I like this statement a lot because we see this on Holly's army and love of their pet is demonstrated by the huge number of interventions that an owner is doing. And, um, you know, sometimes as an owner that maybe is doing less is more, I, I, I would read and go, oh God, I feel like I'm a bad owner. She just gets this. She doesn't get that, 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 and that. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a layering effect that you're kind of inferring here where people go, well, I feed this with this, with this, with this, with this. And I make this homemade, amazing concoction of all bits and bobs. And whether that can lead to people having um, more calorie intake. I do know, though, there's a counter argument to this. There was a study. Um, it was Dr. Nick Cave was talking about it. There is definitely a link with um, commercial diets, and wet diets that is linked to more weight gain and it's not necessarily the diet it's the people's lifestyles so a lot of people that have commercial diets have very busy lives and they're people that commute they've got long hours at work and so they're a bit slack with measuring out so there's a lot more involved and um, if you want to listen to a lovely lovely webinar i'll put a link to it Dr. Nick Cave from Massey University did a talk for Hills Global Symposium as an independent speaker uh, about obesity and how it's a big elephant in the room and it needs to be talked about more. There's loads and loads of awesome content in that and I'll find it and I'll put a link on here for you guys. Yeah. Um, so just looking, let's do top tips. <laughs> and then I can show all of you guys a moose because there's a moose eating on my outside my window. Let's have a look. I want to see a moose. I don't know if you can see it. Wait for a second. Can you see the black dot on the other side of the field or in the middle of no, the field? Wow. That's a black dot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to trust me, it's a moose. And it's okay. not yeah. at all. Hey guys, we've just had a trip to Finland tonight. <laughs> It's so cool. Awesome. He's been coming there every evening now, so he's my new pet. 
Okay. Let's do the tea. Yes. I'm going to start at number 10. That means that you end up with number one. Number 10, flooring, flooring. And I'm really so happy to say that we were chatting before we went live. And I said that I hope in the next five to 10 years, I'm given the opportunity to do maybe a PhD about the impact of flooring on not only debilitated joints and peripheral limbs and backs, but also the effect it has on creating these problems. And Heli went, hey, okay, yeah. <laughs> totally with you on this one 100 agree so flooring 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 please think about traction these dogs need traction number nine number nine is continuum of the flooring and mm -hmm. it is the surfaces where you walk the dog do not go on asphalt concrete or hard sand roads during summertime any hard surface is bad 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 please use soft forest field not sinky but soft bouncy flooring because they don't have sneakers like you guys do that's really yeah and having spent a lot of sensible time talking about ground reaction forces that's a real take home sorry luna keep stink dog <laughs> Number eight from me, because these 10 top tips are supposed to be things that you can start tomorrow, you can enact immediately. I really want you to look at your thresholds. And this was um, something that I learned when I was doing my home service. The amount of times I watch dogs come in and out of people's homes and the effort to get up the steps through the doorway, to step over the threshold. They couldn't quite make it, so they perched their foot on the little PVC plastic door frame and they slipped. Look, watch your dog and look for their movement and look at their facial expressions, look at their ear positions. What are they struggling with? Because when they're struggling, everything's tense, everything's a bit sketchy, everything's gonna hurt more when it goes wrong. So really do look at the home environment in a more detailed way, please, guys. Number seven. Now, I'm trying to save my best to the last, but then I'm worried you'll still <laughs> Do not, this would be my number one actually, but I'll say it now. No ball throwing, no stick throwing. <gasps> yeah! No dog should do that but especially if the dog is obese, none of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about this. There was no setup here, guys. I think I love you. I think more than Lindsay loves you. Ooh, <laughs> this is getting really exciting. The woman is still young. How many people are watching? <laughs> no, totally, totally, totally agree about ball yeah. throwing your bag. Okay, number six for me is getting in and out of cars. Um, this is yes. to steal it from you. No, <laughs> so, but it's a really good one. Mm? Yeah, and we see we see this all the time. And um, at the moment, with the COVID crisis, we have to go and collect the dogs from the car and take them into the practice. Mm. And you're you're running to get to the car to stop the owner letting dog jump out and I I see arthritic cases I see musculoskeletal ill health cases and I'm going no mm. see them throw themselves out of the car please consider what impact this has on the dog think about mm. rapid, think about steps think about access points you can getting in no. via the back door might be better mm. going in via the boots lower levels um number five for you Number five is have routine in the exercise. The worst mm -hmm. thing you can do from the exercise point of view is you work from Monday to Friday. It's busy, you know, you have life, you have children, you have uh, whatever. The dog gets like 15 plus 15 plus 15 minutes a day of exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, pee poo in you go. Then yeah. you have a bit of a guilty conscience. And on Saturday, you'll take the dog to Lake District and then you run and you hike around for six hours. And the poor dog is in pain. So yeah. none of those spikes in the exercise. Then yes. if you have nothing else, do 15, 15, 15 every bloody day. 
No spikes yeah. on Saturdays because routine is the best thing and spikes in movement may provoke and aggravate whatever the yeah. situation may be with the joints. So routine yeah, yeah. is our new best friend. Definitely, definitely. And again, I totally relate to that. I started trying to run what I used to run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not nice and i haven't got arthritis there's the soft tissue discomfort is still a welfare concern in itself you know these dogs are really sore for days afterwards yeah. number four for me um i'm actually really enjoying um working from home a lot more i'm doing a lot more telemedicine consults and stuff so to spend more time with luna but keeping her brain active um has mm. it's been it's been fun, it's challenging, but it's fun. So use interactive feeding, look at the amount of food that they're allowed in a day and then portion it off and make them work for it. I've been having brilliant results with encouraging owners to do that in their daily plan and they're seeing massive changes in their dog's emotional um, state as well as their physical state. So the sort of things that I'm doing is I keep every mushroom um, Tupperware, I keep the Mange 2 trays, I put some food in a bag, in a bag, in a bag, in a box, and she has to work out how to get it out. She's standing, she's moving, she's bending, she's twisting, the brain's engaged. It makes a big difference. So please use those free of charge interventions. They do make a massive difference. Number three. Uh, avoid um high impact sports mm. so that could be playing with big dogs who are bigger and there's a risk of impact and hit and tumbling and just trauma yeah. if your dog is let's say a rottweiler puppy and then you take it out to play with two chihuahuas oh you guys say chihuahua <laughs> Because so we, <laughs> we say chihuahua. You guys oh. say chihuahua, apparently. Yeah. Chihuahua. So if you take your roti puppy to play with two chihuahuas, they will go yeah. and your roti is so clumsy and so big and it will just hurt itself. So yeah. consider who they play with and then also control the intensity and time of play if need be. Mm -hmm especially yeah. if they are uh, obese or if they already have issues with their joints. Yeah, I think so. That's, that's a good one. Okay, my number two, um, I'm really turning into something that's much more, um, I'm, I'm focusing down on client, client compliance, client understanding, caring about where they are in the treatment plan and trying to get them to invest their energies in the right direction. I really, really want to give every owner the confidence that it doesn't matter how much you purchase there's a real tendency that people believe that they need to buy this buy that buy this buy the way out of the problem fix it with money fix it with money no i can honestly swear in my 18 year vet career the things that have made a big difference is time and thought and pre-thought so think about what you're going to do with your dog so you know think about you know where you're going to walk how difficult it's going to be um how they're going to get in and out of the car you know if you've got a young dog old dog how can the old dog enjoy it have a shorter walk long dog you know longer walk for their other dog i really want you guys not to be caught in the money trap because we see this all the time things like more rugs less drugs you know the weight loss the spending time teaching them a new trick getting them to walk to heal improving their recall stop them pulling on the lead that has a massive impact in the long-term management. It's going to put you in a much better position than you forking out an extra $100 a month on a load of supplements that have no evidence base. Please think about lifestyle management and don't feel guilty about not spending loads of money. I really, really assure you, don't feel like that. Number one. Ooh, can I just say something on the number two? I think that's a really good point. And from clinical reasoning point of view, I think if the dog is obese and you get the weight down, then actually the cost should be down too because you're using less food. So it's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. number one. I think this might be a boring one, but I think it's an important one. 
and it kind of captivates everything that we've been talking about previously. Mm -hmm. Take obesity seriously and mm -hmm. be open to the fact that the dog may be obese mm -hmm. and also be kind to yourself because it is difficult to see it in your own dog because you see the dog every day so mm -hmm. it gains a half a pound a pound you know it, it sneaks mm -hmm. up on you so my number one is use the services of professionals and yeah. by that i mean veterinarians and physiotherapists who can help you in assessing whether or not there is an issue and then if there is an issue what does it mean functionally for this dog of this breed of this type of this individual and how we are going to address it safely and efficiently yeah no i 100 percent agree i think you are top notch yes <laughs> um yeah i've had a wicked time tonight i am um, buzzing um it's been better than i could have ever imagined i'd love you to come back um i'm hoping that you will i hope i haven't scared you off um on a note for cam followers we are growing and um with that we're having a lot more people arrive we want to maintain our empathy our kindness we really encourage all of you guys to consider how the other person feels when we're communicating with each other. We've got a community group, Holly's Army. We try not to use capitals, guys, because they tend to mean you're shouting. So let's try and keep it all kind on there. So please do go to Holly's Army. Um, lovely group of people. On a note to support Cam, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of um, commitment from the CAM team to make things like this happen. We've got the booklets, we've got the tools, we've got the website, the forum, the Holly's Army, Canine Equipment Review page. We've got a lot of people putting a lot of energy in. What do we want back from you? We want your support. So the least you can do is share and talk and discuss. Use our hashtag, your dog more years. You know, start talking about it. Um, I don't know if you can see, but we've got the CAM hoodie. And on the back, it mm -hmm. says your more years. We've got bum bags, we've got beanies, we've got snoods, we've got baseball caps. We've got loads and loads of stuff that we're trying to make people talk about this. We don't sell drugs, we don't sell supplements, we don't sell therapies. We're relying on you guys to publicize how important this is. So please support us, please pop over to the shop, buy a hoodie, buy a t-shirt, you know, get behind a movement to improve the lives of dogs. Helly, I love you. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming and also thank you very much for having me here it was good fun and i hope it was helpful to some people at least it's brilliantly helpful i'll put a link to all the papers that um you yeah. taught me um i'm definitely going to be asking you to come back um, everybody adores you you've got hundreds and hundreds of thank yous of people saying how amazing thank you everybody well done right we're going to see you later guys thanks a lot till next time Bye. Bye.